Hello, I'm Joseph Shore. Today I wanted to talk a little bit to students about the size of the operatic voice. And some of you may be under some illusions regarding the size of the operatic voice. I think almost everyone wants to have a big voice. But exactly what is a big voice is up for grab sometimes. The operatic voice is obviously much uh, louder and richer in partials than the speaking voice. The uh, operatic voice uses a, a totally different setup than the speaking voice does. In speaking, the larynx is high, and neither the diaphragm nor the strap muscles are engaged when we speak. So it is, it is as though we use only a tiny bit of the instrument when we speak. When we sing, at least operatically, then very different, a very different setup is engaged. The larynx is lowered by the tracheal pull of the breath, which also cues the strap muscles, especially the sternothyroids, to pull down and anchor the larynx. At the same time, uh, other muscles pull up, especially the stylopharyngeus muscle, and that supports the larynx by opposite pulls. Uh, what that does then is that it opens up within the larynx an extra cavity as a resonator. The cavity is called the ventricle of Morgani, and it literally is the cavity which is formed by the true vocal cords and right above them the false vocal cords. Now, in, in speaking, uh, that cavity is virtually collapsed, so it does not offer any assistance in resonating the speaking voice. But when the larynx is in span by opposite pulls, that cavity also expands, and since it's the closest cavity to the laryngeal tone, it amplifies very high frequencies uh, to a, a strong degree. That is the, the uh, cavity which is responsible for what some people call the squeal or the chiaro or the vocal ring. It's not found in the sinuses, in the nose, or behind the nose. It's due to the cavity within the larynx when the larynx is lured properly and suspended properly. You have to have both things. But you know how to do that, or at least your brain knows how to do that. And there's a synaptic control center in the right temporal lobe which directs the whole process that we use in singing or in making very loud animal imitative noises. So that's a fact. It's not up for discussion. The singing voice, when used operatically, is far, far bigger than the speaking voice. And not only bigger than the speaking voice, it has a much different timbre. When the larynx lowers, it actually then lengthens the whole resonating tube which is the combination of the pharynx and the mouth together. So when the resonating tube is lengthened, that means the vowel frequencies are shifted down towards their darker sides. It's the same principle as in a pipe organ. The very high-pitched sounds on the pipe organ are little short pipes. The low pitches on the organ are big, tall pipes. The more air, the, the longer the pipe, the lower the frequency. The shorter the pipe, the higher the frequency. So when the larynx lowers, it adds substantial uh, length to the vocal tract, and therefore all the vowels are shifted down towards their darker side. This is the old scudo in the famous Chiaro school or in the Italian school. So it's interesting, many people translate Chiaro school as 
bright and dark at the same time. It doesn't really mean that. Chiaro means clear, and oscuro means dark. So chiaro oscuro is a description of a tone which is clear and dark at the same time. For a, a low voice character to demonstrate that, Cesare Siepe. He could, it, that tone was so dark and mellow, but had so much ring, could carry to the back of any hall. Uh, so when the voice is used well, the vowels will be shifted down to a darker side, and the voice will be much louder and more ringy because the same mechanism opens up that laryngeal cavity within the larynx and gives us the singer's format. I can't sing on this microphone or it will distort for you, but you can listen to any of my other videos on YouTube to get an example of what I'm talking about. So, given that, most opera singers have sufficient uh, amplitude in their voice to do their jobs. I know we're always taken with particular singers who have a great abundance of amplitude. The really loud tenors like Mario Belmonico. Uh, but these people occupy a very small segment of uh, overall singers. Even Corelli could not match Delmonico's uh, size of voice. Heinz told me that when, when Delmonico first came to the Met, uh, they were all doing a rehearsal, uh, an orchestra rehearsal, uh, the first one that Delmonico had been in, uh, Heinz was singing Rampus, and all the other cast was there. And when Delmonico finished Celeste Aida, they said everybody in the cast was just dumbstruck. Their mouths were hanging to the floor. It, he said nobody had ever heard a tenor make that much sound. So these are the are legendary tales, but they do. They do uh, give us some of the romance that we have for exceptionally large voices. How large it is is not the issue, however, because many tenors sang longer than Delmonica did, and many tenors sang with better techniques than Delmonica had. We think of someone who was called the Piccolo Caruso, Eusebio. Now, no one could argue that that was a, a, a magnificent artist and a magnificent instrument, so much so that even, sadly, his alcoholism could not destroy the instrument, at least until it did. But my point is, uh, Björling was a relatively small voice in comparison to Caruso. And yet, what we remember about Björling is not the number of decibels he made, but the beauty of his voice, the caress of the voice, the incredible phrasing, the almost heartbreaking flutter in his fast vibrato. And these are all things that are considerably more important than how many decibels you make. There are many great voices whose overall size varies enormously from day to day. As you know, I think, I spent 20 years singing with Jerome Hines in his own opera company. And I've heard him in uh, many different shapes, in A1 shape, and just in enough volume to compete with any bass that ever existed 
And then other times, not so much. Uh, the more complicated a voice is, uh, the easier it is to get a little bit out of whack. And also, the more successful you get as an opera singer, the more you're singing, and you don't always get enough rest. If you sing tired, the voice is going to be small. And it can vary then from performance to performance. I'll give you an example. I have heard Hines sing uh, with his company and, and at the Met as the biggest sound you ever heard. Uh, in Simone Bocanegra, uh, when in the first act there, where he has a big scene with uh, Simone, uh, I heard Heinz just blow the, the baritone away, even when the baritone was McNeil. But then at another time, uh, Jerry wasn't in such good shape, and I saw uh, Heinz sing uh, Spada Fuchil with uh, McNeil, and McNeil's voice was far bigger that day. See, so the amount of decibels varies greatly with circumstance. You know, how, much, how rested are you? How are you feeling? H.C.O. Uh, great example. As a beginnings singer, just straight out of college, I did uh, Marulo in a production of Regaletto, the only time I ever did Marulo, with Louis Quirico as Regaletto and Ezio, Ezio Flagello as Spada Pacino. When Flagello came in for rehearsals, he made the biggest, most fantastic bass sound I'd ever heard. And Heinz had just been there singing with the symphony. And I turned to my voice teacher and I said, that's bigger than Heinz. And he had to agree on that day, at that moment, at that particular time. So we did the performance. It was great, great performance. And then were all the cast is downstairs getting entertained and, and getting fed, you know. And so uh, Quinico was persuaded to get up and sing, and he did. And he sang far better than he'd sung the opera just a few minutes ago. And Flagello got up and sang beautifully but with about half of the voice that we'd heard in that first rehearsal. And it was beautiful, but not nearly as big. So the, the actual size of the voice varies greatly. And also according to the construction of the voice. Uh, my voice had most of its amplitude in the upper regions in the male head voice. And in a house, in a, a theater, which reflected those short wavelengths, my voice could sound as big as anybody's. But if I was singing in a dead house, a house with a lot of cushions and uh, lousy construction, I can, the kind of house that would absorb short wavelengths then I didn't sound nearly as big. So the construction of the opera house is also has also something to do with how big the voice sounds. I'll give you another example. Uh, a friend of mine, Richard T. Gill, he's gone now, but Richard T. Gill was a great bass at the Metropolitan Opera. He had been a professor of economics at Harvard and discovered he had this gift of singing and he really had taught economics enough, so he made a big switch to opera, and he got taken in by the Met very quickly. It was a big voice, and he was the first cover for Heinz in all of his roles. <laughs> Heinz was doing uh, Boris in both uh, 1975 and 76, alternating with Tavola, but his cover, his first cover, was Richard T. Gill, who sounded enormously like Heinz. Well, we're doing uh, uh, Lohengrin at the Arizona Opera, and I'm doing Tell Ramones. Now, the Arizona Opera 
sang in Tucson in a very generous hall. The hall uh, reflected High Upper Parcher's well. It, it was especially kind to the short wavelengths in my voice. So I had no trouble at all seeing Telemuth there. But uh, Dr. Gill had quite a bit of trouble singing King Henry there because his voice sat much lower. It was a very low bass. And the wavelengths are much longer. And they're not getting amplified nearly as well as mine are. And he begins to panic a little bit. He says to me, you know, I could sing this at the Met, but it's hard as heck for me to sing it here. And he got so nervous during uh, a dress rehearsal that he called the conductor to come backstage. And he said to the conductor, if you don't hold that orchestra down for my Herod's God, I am going to refuse to sing and I'm going to walk off the stage. Now, there's an extreme example about someone who had gotten used to the great acoustics that the Metropolitan Opera has. You could sing almost a pop heavier at the Met than in most of these regional opera houses. And the conductor, and he was very generous and very helpful. And he did bring the orchestra down for my book, and the show went on, and, and well, we got through it just fine. But there's an example how a big voice at the Met had a real hard time being a big enough voice uh, to sing at a regional opera house because it wasn't constructed nearly as well as the Met. So, to make a long story short now, you will have the natural volume that you have if you sing correctly. If you sing correctly, that natural volume that you have will be enough in, all, in most cases for most of the opera companies you sing in. If you sing in an exceptionally dead opera house, um, maybe nobody is going to really sound all that great. I've been in a few places like that where I virtually had to sing by faith and not by hearing because I couldn't get any feedback for what, what was actually coming out there. So this emphasis on size of voice is both wrong and right. It's right in that if you sing properly, the voice will be much bigger than your speaking voice. It's wrong if you try to force your voice to be louder simply because you think that you'll rank higher if you can sing louder. That's not true. There were plenty of people who could sing louder than Bure, but they weren't nearly as memorable. And they're all, almost all of their names are now lost in history. So, the primary thing is to get a good technical training in how to use the larynx like Belcanto demonstrated and required the chiaro scuro, the clear dark tone. And you will experience vibrations in all parts of the vocal track in singing. You shouldn't try to uh, have vibrations only in one section. You shouldn't try to isolate and promote the according to the pitches that you're singing and to the dynamics you're singing, the vowels you're singing. You'll have a variety of, of vibrations all throughout the vocal track. Uh, permit that. The system of bel canto known as appoggio permits vibrations in all parts of the vocal track and does not approve of trying to isolate uh, vibrotactile sensation in any one area. Not the oral pharynx, not the mask, uh, not, certainly not the throat. Uh, 
no one area is selected. Instead, Belcanto preserved its standards by teaching how to use the breath properly, how to form the vowels properly, and how to adjust the vowels properly. And in so doing, the voice became its natural size and bel canto quality. So, who sang louder? Siepi, Tozzi, Heinz, which bass? Ghiaro, Flagello. They all had wonderful, wonderful sounds. And on any given day, one of them might have been louder than the other. That's you know, not really much to talk about. So don't worry about whether or not you can match so-and-so in volume. Think about the crucial aspects of technique. How you're using the breath, how you're forming the vowel, and how you're adjusting the vowel. Maybe that will give you a little tip. Bye for now.